Uh, Warby Parker really starts with, uh, with glasses. Uh, probably uh, one of the uh, best examples of form and um, function, uh, a fashion accessory that uh, really is part of one's identity, right? It's the first thing that, that someone sees um, uh, when they walk up to you. Um, and this story really starts uh, around a frustration of going into an optical shop, being super excited, uh, and walking out feeling like you got ripped off. Um, and the, the, the story begins uh, at, at Wharton, where I was uh, getting my MBA along with uh, three close friends, Jeff, Andy, and Dave. Uh, Dave had been traveling right before school and uh, had left his $700 glasses in the seat pocket uh, of an airplane. Um, and now as a full-time graduate student, he couldn't afford the $700 glasses. So we started sort of thinking about this. Uh, and he had worked at Allen and Company beforehand. So you know, $700 didn't, didn't matter at that point. Um, but this premise is why should uh, technology that's been around for over 800 years cost as much uh, as an iPhone, right? There's no rare earth metals um, in, in these frames and lenses. Uh, it, it just didn't resonate. It didn't make sense. Uh, the, the other thing that we were noticing was that category after category was moving online, whether it was Zappos selling shoes, Blue Nile selling engagement rings, uh, products that you never thought could be sold online were now being sold online, um, save for one big category, uh, glass, glasses. So the sort of light bulb went off where there could be this amazing opportunity for us to uh, design the glasses that we love and then sell directly to consumers online. Um, because it's just, right, every single category uh, at, at the time was just moving larger and larger. And you look at apparel and accessories, right, at the time was uh, upwards of 15% of the total market. So th it seemed like there was this massive opportunity. And eyewear is a massive category. It's about $100 billion a year globally, uh, $30 billion alone in the U.S. Um, and, and at the time, uh, eyewear had less than 1% were sold uh, online. Now, um, when you buy a pair of glasses, you might buy a pair of Ray-Bans or Oakley's or Oliver Peoples, right? The, these are probably the most famous uh, eyewear only brands. Uh, or you might buy uh, a fashion brand like Prada or Chanel, uh, Dolce Gabbana, um, which uh, are often licensed to a third party that designs it and distributes it. You may go to a big chain store to, to purchase those glasses, like Lens Crafters or Sunglass Hut, uh, Pearl Vision, uh, and you may use eye ins uh, vision insurance. So iMed is the second largest vision insurance company in the world. What most people don't realize is that this entire ecosystem is uh, owned by one company, Luxottica, uh, publicly traded, co-listed on the Milan and New York Stock Exchanges. Uh, I think right now it's got a market cap of like $28 billion. Um, so when you go into a lens crafters, you have this illusion of choice that you have these 40 different brands, but they're all being designed, manufactured, and distributed by the same company. So, we saw this interesting industry dynamic and then it clicked like, okay, well that's why glasses uh, are, are so expensive um, and thought that there was this opportunity to, to really create change um, in, in the industry. Now the question is how do you go about doing that? And you know, I think the, the best uh, sort of organizational journeys are, are ones that are constantly de-risking uh, the, uh, a process um, where uh, you're trying to invest as little time and money into an idea uh, before you realize that it actually um, is going to be successful. So here, Jeff, Andy, Dave, and I were at business school um, and we were trying to figure out, okay, well, we have this idea. Um, it's actually one that is, you know, we're, we're not able to sleep because we're thinking about it constantly. And, and that's when you know that sort of your, your heart's in it. Uh, but what do we need to do to actually test this thing? Uh, and of course, we would ask uh, our friends like, hey, what do you think of this idea? And most of the time, everyone's like, you guys are crazy idiots. Um, but uh, you, at some point, you have the confidence to continue to move forward. And, and we felt that this was strong enough an idea that we should uh, pursue it. And then it was, well, what's the minimum required that we need to do? And it's, well, 
we needed product to sell, so we designed our first collection of 27 shapes in uh, two to three colors each. We needed to build a website, um, and, and this was interesting because the four of us uh, didn't have any technical expertise, uh, but we would literally uh, create wireframes of each individual web page on a PowerPoint, and then we'd print it out and go up to our, our friends and say, hey, this is a home page, what button would you press? Oh, this is the gallery page, what button would you press? And so our user testing was literally using you know, printed out uh, prototypes. We decided that it was going to be sort of critical for us to remove any barrier to, to entry to, to sort of purchase uh, this pair of glasses because that's the one feedback that we kept getting time and time again is like, how am I going to buy glasses online? You know, you want to touch and, and, and feel them. So um, we thought, okay, well, we're uh, going to be selling online, so we're building a tech company. There's got to be some technological solution out there. Uh, so we found this facial recognition software where you could upload your photo and virtually try on your glasses. And this is actually Dave, my, my co-founder and, and co-CEO. I sort of never travel anywhere without him. Um, and, and we thought that this was really interesting technology. But when we would uh, test it ourselves, we found that it actually didn't give us necessarily the confidence to sort of really purchase just by using this. Um, and, and that was one of those sort of come to Jesus moments where it's like, is this actually going to work? Because this is not necessarily, you know, the right thing that's going to instill the level of con confidence required for someone to give a credit card and, and sort of wait for this health product to, to arrive. And that's when we went back to the drawing board and came up with this idea to do a home try-on where you could select five pairs of glasses. You have five days to try it on at home. And at that point, you can decide to purchase or not. You return the glasses, we'll put in the prescription lenses. And this was really what gave us the confidence to continue to invest sort of more time and energy in, into pursuing the idea. Because one, this overcomes that sort of fitting issue because you actually physically try them on before you buy. And second, this actually helped our unit economics work uh, because we had decided early on that we were going to offer free shipping and free returns because we thought that was also what was needed to instill confidence, right? You trust a company more that is, uh, stands behind their product and is willing to let you return it that will give you sort of pay for the shipping. And the thing about glasses is that it's always a custom product, right? So you have to cut and edge the lenses and insert them for every single frame. So if we were taking tons of returns, Zappos has upwards of 40% returns, right? It would completely bankrupt the business because we couldn't, re unlike sort of shoes, you can't sort of resell. You have to pop out the lenses, trash those, and that's the highest percent of your cost of goods sold. So this was a major breakthrough for us sort of pre-launch. Um, the other thing that we were trying to figure out is what type of business were we um, going to build? What was the, the type of business where we would be excited to come to work every day and not roll over and sort of hit that snooze button? Um, and, and for us, it was this idea um, that we're going to create a business that did good in the world. Um, and of course, that's a really vague and, and, and sort of maybe even a bold statement, but how do you actually operationalize that? Um, and we sort of thought, well, let's sort of consider everybody that we impact when we make decisions. And uh, this idea of a stakeholder business, which is not just taking into account shareholders, but everybody uh, that sort of comes in contact with the business as well. So our customers, our employees, the community at large, and the environment. From a customer perspective, um, it was about uh, just creating exceptional experiences and providing uh, transparent and uh, appropriate pricing. So $95 instead of 500, uh, a, a funny story there is that we actually at one point thought that we could charge $45 um, for a $500 product. And we went, um, again at the time we were uh, at, at graduate school, and we went to the head of the marketing department at Wharton, who is a, a pricing expert, uh, Professor Raju. And we walked in with this beautiful PowerPoint. Uh, if there was one thing that the four of us could do was make an, an amazing PowerPoint. Uh, 
you know, Dave and, and Jeff had both worked at Bain and Company before and then went into private equity. Our, my other co-founder was a former investment banker. So we had a, a beautiful deck and we go in, we put it on his desk and we say, <laughs> we're going to change uh, the optical industry. We're going to charge uh, $45 for a $500 pair of glasses. Um, and he looks at us and he's like, ah, I don't think so, and slides the deck back. And we're like, what are you talking about? You haven't even looked at it. Look, we have all these graphs. They all go up and to the right. And <laughs> he, he turns out to us and he says, at $45, one-tenth of the price of what a normal person would pay, you're outside of the realm of believability. Nobody will have confidence in your product. Uh, price is probably the biggest indicator of quality. So we thought, oh, that, that makes a ton of sense. And then he said, and whatever you're projecting your cost of goods to be, it's going to increase. It's probably going to double. And you're going to have no gross margin with to run the business or to market to people and to let people know that you even exist. So you know, we walked out of that meeting pretty deflated. Um, but uh, we mocked up a, a home page. Uh, and just what we did is we created a survey uh, with the only difference was a price. And we created, we got several hundred people and we created random groups and random samples and we sent them surveys uh, with different pricing on it and asked a very simple question, how likely are you to purchase this pair of glasses? And we actually found that the willingness to purchase increased uh, up until about $100, uh, at which point it plateaued and eventually came down. Uh, and sure enough, Professor Raji was right, right? The, the price was a big indicator uh, of quality. And we decided to price at 95 because we thought 99 sounded too discounty and cheap. Even though we were providing a, a, a product for a fraction of the price, we still wanted it to be aspirational. Um, and this was uh, hopefully going to be a brand that, that inspires and also offers sort of beautiful fashion and design. The other thing is that, sure enough, our cost of goods uh, doubled from what we thought it would be because when you're going through design and production process, right, every step of the way, it's really easy to say, oh, let's just add that. Oh, we want, you know, the five barrel hinges or the Teflon coated screws. Um, you probably have no idea what those are, but they sound fa fancy, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and he was right. And when we launched, um, that $95 was we really view as sort of a, a key to success that it got sort of uh, our, our model off to the right start.